good evening, everyone. And um, as uh, Leslie said, I'm Luna. I am based here in Queens, and uh, it's an honor to be here. I come to this work through a little bit of work uh, against uh, sex trafficking, but broadly around uh, combating human trafficking. We are working on the issue of um, uh, human trafficking, which like labor trafficking as well as sex trafficking uh, around the uh, world, but like uh, we're working on it from a U.S. perspective, like we're uh, working with trafficked, uh, trafficking survivors here, mostly labor trafficking. Um, so I'm sure you're all waiting to hear from the, the film crew rather than me. But so I wanted to start off by asking a little bit about your background and how you came to this project. Why this topic? Uh, well, I was really looking for some, I, my expertise as a director is working with kids and I was looking for something uh, to do, a film to do that could help real kids in dire need. And uh, when I read uh, Patricia McCormick's novel, Sold, uh, I read it in one sitting and um, was literally moved to tears a number of times reading the book and um, got a knock on the door. It was a teacher friend of mine uh, and um, she saw me crying and wondered why I was upset and I said, well, I'm just reading this amazing, just beautifully written book and, and, uh, and I told her what it was about and she started crying um, because she had just literally the day before returned from Nepal and India where she had been doing art with trafficked children. Um, and um, she described this girl that she had met who was uh, hiding under a table uh, who had just been rescued. And um, you know, in the making of the film, uh, Jane and I saw a number of kids who had just been rescued. And, and uh, you know, I, I've been to several wars as a filmmaker and I've never uh, felt that kind of, um, just I've never seen a human being in a sort of state of animal terror uh, like I have when I've seen a kid who has just been rescued from being trafficked. Um, basically, when a, when a girl is rescued from the brothels, they, take, they put her on a three-month watch, a three-month suicide watch. Uh, they often cut themselves or try to hang themselves or try to run away. And gradually, what you see is the older girls in the NGOs uh, help them um, come back, help them trust again, and it's an incredible process watching these older girls uh, talking quietly and bringing clothes to these kids who have just come in. And, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I can speak for both of us. Our, our hearts were really, um, really broken multiple times in the research phase of making the film. A and, um, and now, uh, after the film has been made, we want to use the film as a, as a vehicle to create change in India, Nepal, and in the U.S., yeah, Jeffrey felt so strongly about the book and called me and said, you have to read this. And once I read it, I knew that this would be a great film and also would be something that we could use globally as a tool for change. The book has been translated into 32 languages globally. And, uh, you know, we this was a seven-year journey for us. And now that the film is made, we know that we can that it will be seen globally and, and has already created great change. The other thing we wanted to do is, is create a film that was full of hope, that you have to see the darkness to, to find the light. And so we showed the darkness, but we also wanted it to be empowering for young people, for them to be enraged and involved and want to do something about it right away. So what, what's sort of extraordinary is that in the process of, of putting the financing together for the film, uh, a lot of our investors from Seattle, um, there's, a, there's a group that we called the Soul Sisters, um, for lack of a better word. Um, but they, a, a number of these women came to India and went to um, a, a number of the NGOs that we also had gone to do our research in. And um, they got so engaged in the issue that when they came back to Seattle, they formed a 501c3 called Stolen Youth. And Jane was part of, uh, you know. Yeah, and we've raised over a million and a half dollars in the last two years for anti-trafficking. <laughs> 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 
and and now uh, there's you know we're partnered. We we want to partner with multiple um, campaigns and multiple groups that are doing work on on the issue. Uh, one of our partners is a group called Child Reach International, and they've just started um, something called Taught Not Trafficked, and um, there they kicked it off in London when we premiered there. And um, Taught Not Trafficked is basically uh, an effort to um, to work in the two hottest trafficking areas, uh, Nuarkot and uh, Sandu Palchuk in Nepal. Those are the villages where uh, in Nuarkot th there's no girls over 12 at all because um, they're all trafficked. And uh, Sandu Palchuk is, is one of the main trafficking hubs. Um, and you know, from Nepal into India, there's about 20,000 girls that are trafficked every year. Um, I went to uh, one border crossing of the 26 and I was there for half a day, and uh, six girls were intercepted uh, while I was there. And they're intercepted by a group called Naiti Nepal, and they're uh, survivors who are monitoring the border. They're monitoring 11 border crossings of the 26. The traffickers know when they come on, which is at 8 o'clock, and they know when they leave, which is at 5 o'clock. Um, but um, they did a raid at 6 o'clock right next door to where we were staying, and three girls were rescued there because they saw them coming in, um, and then th three other girls were rescued while we were watching the border. Um, so I think the 20,000 is an underestimate, but in within India itself right now, there's a new study that just came out, and um, they're, they're estimating 16 million women and children are coerced and forcibly, uh, uh, you know, forced into the sex slave trade within India, and they estimate that 70% of those women are between the age of 9 and 18. So that's 6,400,000 But this kids. happens in every single country in the world, every single country. It's right here in our own backyard. And we um, want to support this hashtag taught not trafficked campaign by Child Reach International because children are 80% less likely to be trafficked if they stay in school. So education is key. It's a very key component to prevention. Yeah, and they're also bringing survivors um, to uh, these schools so that they'll be speaking to the kids and the families directly, and they're creating a feeding program so that they'll be incentivized to stay in school, and the families will, the entire family will get food if the kid stays in school, which is a very... It's a very good way to do that. Um, but a lot of the, this issue is, uh, you know, there are two aspects of it that are really fundamental. One is poverty, and the other is the status of women in relationship to the status of men. And that both of these things have to be addressed. And it's a very complicated issue because even, um, you know, in our country, the, there are laws against trafficking. But um, in our country, there's nowhere, in, in the U.S., there's nowhere to put kids um, if they're forced into prostitution, uh, except in juvenile delinquent, um, you know, in juvie. So they, they are criminalized uh, because there's no other place to put them physically. But that's changing. Laws are changing. In Seattle, one of the sea changes that we saw with our programs is that now the police know that underage prostitutes are victims and not criminals. So it's very important that uh, law enforcement realizes when a girl comes in and she's 14 that she's not doing this by choice. And, uh, but those things are changing, and we're seeing hope. Things are changing day by day, little by little. And we will not stop. You know, we, you, you know trafficking just should not be happening, and there's too much of it. It's a $150 billion business. So we are creating a campaign with SOLD. SOLD is now a tool for change that many different organizations can use to fundraise, can use for their programs, and we'll be partnering with many different um, global NGOs and U.S. nonprofits to make that happen. So we'd love you to join us uh, in this process, um, community awareness, community support is really critical. Uh, and so we'd love you to go to uh, soldthemovie.com and join us on our website. It's, uh, there's a, a place where you can join us. You can submit your email. And then there's a, a mobile app. Um, yeah, if you could 
take out your phones. I think a lot of people have their phones out already, but I know you don't usually do that in the movie theater, but if you could take out your phones and turn them on, there will be something special we're going to do at the end of the Q&A so you can join our campaign. Do you want to? I guess we'll have, um, I think uh, we'll continue the conversation around how we, uh, all of us can get involved in the process. But I wanted to take a step back and talk a little more about the process. What was it like to be filming in Nepal and India, like, both uh, from an artistic perspective as well as, like, you know, did you get support? Who were your supporters? Uh, who was, uh, was there any opposition? So in Nepal, we were very concerned about um, just um, getting uh, in a situation where we had to bribe our way through it. Um, so we, um, we got Madan and Hari. Uh, Madan and Hari, uh, Madan plays the father, the stepfather of the girl. And Hari is the guy that sings the song when um, the Tihar ceremony is going on and, and the trafficker um, talks to the girl's dad. Uh, so he's the guy singing. Uh, and Madan and Hari are two, uh, they're, they're really famous in Nepal. They've been doing comedy for 30 years, but they're also philanthropists, and they were arrested for criticizing the monarchy. And uh, when they were arrested, the country shut down for, um, I think it was two weeks. There was a bund, a strike. Uh, nothing moved uh, until they were released. And when they were released, the monarchy fell. 350-year-old monarchy fell. And so they're just like really beloved and everywhere we went, it was like, what can we do to help you? Because Hari and Madan were part of our, uh, our group. And when we go to Nepal with the film, Hari and Madan will um, convene uh, all the stakeholders uh, that are working on the issue of trafficking. They'll gather together uh, with, Mari, uh, with Hari and Madan and, and our film. And there'll be a, a three-day conference on what can we do to really address this in Nepal. Um, so that's really exciting. Uh, in India, um, we went to uh, New Light, uh, to Ermi Basu, and to Apniap, and a place called Shanlap, and uh, in Mumbai, uh, where most of our actors are from, we went to a number of NGOs there too, the Rescue Mission and St. Catharines, and we probably met about 2,000 girls uh, who had been sex trafficked in the process of uh, So that's the doing research, our research and the... We scouted locations in Mumbai and Pune and, and different areas in India, but Calcutta, I mean, Jeffrey always had this vision of old Calcutta, and that's where the story takes place. And so we finally got there to scout, and we found the perfect neighborhood in North Calcutta. Looks like you just stepped into 1940s Calcutta. It's so textured and, you know, warm-looking and beautiful in its, you know, old way. And we found an area where th there were all of these... 300-year-old buildings. We found the perfect apartment building, and we took it over. We, there were only a few people still living there. And moved, they moved into another building while we were shooting. We had the entire apartment building, and that was Happiness House for 26 days. And then we were out on the road for the rest. But we had a fantastic crew. We had mostly um, crew from Calcutta, but we brought in some keys from Mumbai. Fantastic casting director, Tess Joseph, and... Uh, we were well taken care of, but we were a very low budget film. So we were not in, you know, big, huge, nice hotels, and we didn't have all the services that we would have, you know, on a big Hollywood film. This was a very small U.S. indie film shooting in India. So we were, you know, on the ground running the whole time. It was a tough shoot, but amazing. We had a really dedicated crew. Um, Tabashir Zuthi was our costume designer and our set designer, and she did a phenomenal job. We only brought um, three people from America besides the two of us, um, and, um, and everyone else was from Mumbai and Calcutta, and uh, they were all hand-picked, uh, and they were ex extraordinary. They were great, and they worked very hard. And um, we, um, while we were filming, we burned something called uh, Loban, which is coconut husks. Um, to create atmosphere, which is smoke, to make uh, you know the the brothel look. I don't think it's very smoky. And um, we were all hacking like we were smoking three packs a day, um, and it was really that was really horrible. Um, and filming in the um, the room where the the kid is first uh, locked up, uh, that was really horrible. Uh, that room was just um, 
every time we filmed there, all of us were really depressed. Um, the, the walls, uh, our art department had used motor oil on the walls to make it uh, greasy and dark and, and disgusting. And if you touched anything, you, 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 it was just like I had to go, I had to throw my clothes away. Um, and we made the film, them. right? And Jeffrey wrote most of the film. But every time we had to go back into that room, we'd look at the AD and go, we have to go back in that room? Are you kidding me? <laughs> the, the, the most extraordinary thing was Niar, uh, the kid that plays Lakshmi. We, we Tess, Joseph, uh, saw a 1,000 kids. She videotaped 700. And when Niar's audition came, we all like saw it. And, and we were literally weeping and laughing watching this kid's audition. And we knew we'd found her. Um, we spent six months looking for her. Tess and her team went to Nepal, uh, I think, two times, and they, they went all over India. I went uh, quite a bit over America looking as well. Uh, so we have some special guests that we want to bring up. Yeah, so um, Patty McCormick, Patricia McCormick, who wrote the novel. Uh, the novel Sold has been uh, translated into 32 languages. And it was nominated for a National Book Award. It won a Quill Award. Wow. <laughs> well, this is the, uh, the third time that I've seen the film, and every time I cry. It's so moving, and it's so... I'm, I'm so honored that you took the book and expanded upon it and made something so beautiful. And that you guys were in it not just to make a beautiful film, but to create change. So I'm very grateful. So, uh, we were so grateful for the story. I mean, this, this, I don't know if any of you have read the book, but if you haven't read the book, please do read the book. It's beautiful. I call the book a prayer song poem. And, uh, you know, we really tried to keep the tone of that in the film. Um, it's unlike any other book you would ever read, and um, it's just extraordinary writing. Um, and the entire crew read the book, and, and, you know, production assistants would come up to me and, like, discuss scenes from the book because we were all so deeply moved by it. And, um, and we, you know, Patty did a tremendous amount of research, so all the details in the book uh, were based on uh, three girls' stories. And um, so we actually went to the same places that Patty went, and we went to a few others in addition, um, because her, her method of writing is very similar to my method of making a movie, which is research, research, research. And yeah, I, um, yeah. that note, I want to ask Patty a question also, right? because it all started with you in the at least this project, uh, I, I think uh, Jeff and Jane have taken it and made a beautiful movie. Although, you know, it's tough to say a beautiful movie about something so difficult. But, but I believe, I guess you'll agree with me that it is a beautiful movie, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But it started with you. So I wanted to ask you, like, how did you come upon this issue? How did you do your research? Like, it's not, it's an area that, you're not from, obviously, right? But like, how did you maneuver the complexities? Well, um, as Jane has already said so eloquently, trafficking happens all over the world. But back in 2004, I think, or 2003, I was on vacation and I met a young man who was a photographer. And he was somebody who was actually sneaking into the brothels, posing as a customer. And he explained to me what trafficking was all about. And at the time, it wasn't something that was in the news the way it is now. And I remember thinking, has someone told this story from the girl's point of view? Because as Jeffrey said, um, it works on your heart. I think when we read these big news stories and we hear statistics, we tend to shut down and feel kind of hopeless about an issue. But when you uh, look at it from one child's point of view, it, it calls on your empathy in a whole new way. The reason that I went to India and Nepal uh, was not because the problem is worse there than it is anywhere else. The truth is that I went there because work had already begun on fighting trafficking in Nepal, at mighty Nepal. And I was full of fear about going into these countries where I had no experience. 
and um, looking at the worst of their societies. And I was really surprised by how open and how helpful people were to me in those two communities. And I was full of fear directing the film as an American um, because, um, you know, even though I have a Bengali stepdad, I'm still, you know, an American. <laughs> and um, what's been extraordinary about uh, bringing the film out into the public is that the, that the Desi community in particular has really embraced it. Um, I think what's going on in India and Nepal is really huge. I think there's a lot of change. I think there's a, a rising women's movement and in both of those countries. And, um, and there's more and more uh, women uh, who are coming to power and who are getting educated. And it's really, it's very exciting. Um, so I think the film is, uh, you know, will serve to further all of that um, because real strides have been made already. So I could sit here and ask a lot of questions, but I'm sure you guys are also... I'd like to bring to up uh, Saira Royan, who played Mrs. Tripathi. And um, <laughs> I'd, I'd also like to just uh, point out John... Uh, where are you, John? McMill yeah, just stand up. John uh, did the music for the film. Uh, yeah. He uh, did an amazing job um, writing the, the, writing the uh, film. I was listening to John's music for months, and then I realized, oh, I should just call this guy. And, uh, and, and he did an extraordinary job. Uh, he also composed the music for Born Into Brothels, which was really one of my inspirations for making this film, and I just think he's just a really talented composer. So, any questions? We found out that one of the girls went home and was not accepted very well. Um, I, it made me wonder what happened to Lakshmi, or what you think might have happened to her after she got home to her parents. Um, so, uh, you know, the movie doesn't end with her going home. Uh, there were various drafts where she did go home and where her mother hugged her uh, and her dad um, felt really embarrassed and, and sad uh, that this had occurred. Um, the truth is that very few of these kids are, are accepted back home. Um, that's just the truth. And it's changing, but um, that's, that's mainly they're not uh, accepted back home. How is the reaction to the actress, the, the girl who played the lead, Lakshmi? Right, in her community, in her family, in her because this is very, very. Her family, rapid. her personal family. Yeah. yeah. So her dad is a um, composer, and her mom's a singer, and they're they were very supportive. They knew what we were doing, and they're they're uh, very proud of their daughter, and uh, she's you know one of the best actors I've ever worked with. H how old is she? She uh, celebrated her thirteenth birthday on I think our fourth day of shooting. We had four cakes and 15 minutes. Everyone got one bite of each cake, and then we went back to work. It was the worst birthday she'd ever had. <laughs> but it was also really... How long know, was the shoot? Uh, oh. She is going to be 15 this September. Jeffrey, thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, this film is timely, and I think you were very fortunate to be connected with Ruchi Gupta at Apneha, because that's one of the organizations which tries to re-establish the lives of uh, some of these young girls. Also, I wanted to say that uh, in New York City, there is a group of clergy, clergymen and women who are holding a round table to discuss this very topic next week. And so your film is very timely. At the same time, <clears throat> to give hope, uh, both Delta, uh, Southwest, 
and a couple of other international airlines have begun a training program for their stewardesses to be able to identify young women who are being moved from one country to another as part of the trafficking traffic. And uh, these airline staff are being trained to look for certain signs and certain demeanor and uh, uh, hopefully that would help slow down, if not stop, some people in their uh, movement. Thank you but for bringing thank, it up. Thank you right. very much. Like, there are actually and some of them in the audience. Airli airline ambassadors yes. are in the house. They, uh, yes. where are, where's They're Nancy? All the way up. Stand up, Nancy. Nancy's uh, trained 32 airports uh, to identify traffickers. Uh, I think GEMS is in the house tonight. Or is anyone from GEMS? GEMS is a great organization on the ground mm -hmm. in the U.S. Ruchira yeah. not only is, is doing apnea, but she actually changed the laws to make uh, traffickers uh, do really intense prison time. Now we have to get the laws enforced. Um, but she's really an advocate. So we have the mic uh, here. But I have several questions, but I limit myself uh, to, to one. one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when they did the Slumdog Millionaire, uh, I'm glad it was done by a, a director from England because they took a, a native Indian story and told the story to the Western audience because this story, some of from the continent we know, uh, but uh, so who, whom do you have in mind when you are writing the script or directing and projecting because Indian audience know, Nepalese audience know, even if they don't fully explore the way you explored. Uh, are you trying to tell the story to the West? I mean, I have other questions, but I limit myself. Yeah. So really, I, I um, wanted to tell this story to the world. Um, so I, I tried to craft the film for uh, US, Europe, and India and Asia. Um, I wanted it to, to have an international feel, but, uh, but be a film that could uh, you know, resonate with any audience. Uh, we have yet to go to India. We'll see how it's received there. Um, we're, we're hoping to be part of the Mumbai uh, Film Festival. We'll see. Um, and, um, you know, Slumdog was not beloved by India uh, because uh, Slumdog looked at the underbelly. Um, but also, I think it was a, a very uh, outside take. And uh, we'll see. I don't know how, how we'll be received. I, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I know Europe will embrace the film, and I hope America will as well, and I'm hoping India will as well. It's been a very touchy subject to make a film about, and so we made a narrative film specifically so it could, people could watch it and could really get what it was like to be inside this girl's shoes. But it was a tough film to fund, it was a tough film to put together, it was a tough film to get people behind until we made the film, and now it's a good film, and, I, and everyone... You know, we haven't had any opposition to it so far. Everyone so far, thank God, has embraced it. And we're very, you know, we feel very optimistic about that. And we're so grateful to the people that did support us along the way, our funders and our executive producers, many of whom are here. Um, if they could all stand up, all the executive producers and funders that are here in the house, that would be great so that we can acknowledge you. Please. Yeah, the, the film has would never have happened without you, and we are just so lucky to be here because you supported us. And just coming back to your question, I think the hard thing for some Indians watching the film is it's not in Hindi. Uh, they're sort of taken out for a moment, but then they kind of go with it. Um, but we made the film in such a way that literally all the dialogue is very minimal, and it's on a separate track. So all the sound effects and music or on, on uh, the m &E is on, on one track and the dialogue's in another, so it can be dubbed very easily into multiple languages. We did that very purposefully, and we also use minimal dialogue very purposefully, so it could be subtitled or dubbed very easily. Any question on what it was like for the actors to 
Um, first of all, I'll just say, being an Indian American myself, I'm so proud to be a part of this story because both Jeffrey and Jane took unbelievable devotion and dedication to make sure that they told the story with accuracy and they represented the truth of what's happening to too many people in India. And of course, the story is a global story, but um, you know they really did do a tremendous amount of research. And each of us who were involved in the film, myself as an actress and all the other actors who are a part of it, they gave us the time and the support to really go meet with survivors and you know, I walked the red light district myself at night and they supported us in doing this research because they wanted us to tell the story with authenticity too. Um, and they gave us the time and the luxury to make sure we got the story right. So I feel so proud to be a part of this and to share it at this film festival especially. I think it's uh, extremely important because it is the Asian American Film Festival and that means a lot more to me personally to be here tonight. Thank you.